everyone, and welcome back to Tech Metals Tuesday. I'm your host, Rebecca Jenkins, the head of marketing at TMN Global, and welcome to episode three, where we are going to be talking about dysprosium. Dysprosium is our metal of the week. We're going to go over part one of everything you need to know about dysprosium. And upon research into dysprosium and looking into this rare earth metal, there's not a lot of information out there on the internet today about dysprosium, which really means that it's a metal, it's an element that hasn't really been used before really the past few years. And we're gonna dive into some of the reasons why that is and how the demand for this this element has changed over the, the past years. And so I am going to share with you our agenda for the day and you'll see what I'm talking about. All right, so our medal of the day is Dysprosium here for Tech Metals Tuesday, our series where we talk about rare earth metals, precious metals and technology metals. And so we're gonna dive into these four uh questions or statements what is dysprosium who discovered this element when did we start using dysprosium and its use in the real world we're going to have a part two after this one where we'll talk about the performance history of the prices uh, of the demand for dysprosium and then we'll also talk a little bit about the forecast into the future where is dysprosium going what is the demand looking like in the industry for the next 10 20 years and who is buying dysprosium? And I don't mean who is buying dysprosium, like investors or uh, you know everyday people, but I'm I'm talking about what businesses are investing in dysprosium to create the next generation of rare earth metals or products that are using rare earth metals. So the first question we have is what is dysprosium? Okay, dysprosium is a rare earth metal, which is different than a technology metal. And I'll show you the periodic table of elements in just a second. And you'll see that it's, it's really in a different area of the, the elements that are listed there. And dysprosium is a permanent magnet. So it's, you know, it is something that will connect with other magnets. And it's something that is very strong that can be used in a lot of different products and a lot of different machinery. So dysprosium's atomic number is 66. Its atomic weight is 162.5. Uh, the symbol on the periodic table of elements is dy, and uh, it's in a physical state at 20 degrees Celsius or 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, so mainly it's, it's in a solid form, and that's how we would get it at a real world AG with our partners EMH AG, that it's, it's mainly in this, in this uh, physical solid state at at room temperature and uh, yeah the name is dysprosium and it is here's some of the element properties as well which I wanted to point out something really interesting here is that its melting point is a thousand four hundred and twelve degrees celsius or two thousand five hundred and seventy four degrees fahrenheit this is a really high melting point. If we would compare it to the metal we went over last week, indium, indium is has a melting point of only uh, 150, I, I believe. And so com <laughs> compared with indium, this melting point for dysprosium is really, really high. And this is something very important to know because there's a reason that it's melting point is so high that goes into what it's used for and how it's used in everyday life it's it's use cases so here is the periodic table of elements and as you can see down here this light green color you'll find dysprosium in the dy uh, as a lanthanoid series rare earth element so pretty much all of the rare earth elements or rare earth metals are found in this lanthanoid series and then there's a couple more that are scattered throughout the the main block of the periodic table of elements so what is dysprosium exactly where does it come from who discovered it where did the name come from what is its form 
So dysprosium comes from mainly it's sourced from China, but there's also uh, sources in the USA, in Russia, in Australia, and India. So even though China does have the market share, the market, they're the market leader of sourcing the metals, there are other places that are popping up around the world because countries are realizing there's such a huge need and such a huge demand for the future for rare earth elements in the products that we're developing, especially in the green energy uh, industry. And uh, the next question is who discovered dysprosium? This guy discovered dysprosium. Paul Emile Lecoque de Bois Baudron. I'm sorry to all of our French viewers. I tried my best with his name, um, but this is this is uh, Boy Baudron. He discovered the the rare earth element in 1886. Believe it or not, a, a long time ago. This man is a French chemist, and he actually was responsible for for finding the the technology metal gallium as well, which is in our portfolio at TMN Global. So he he discovered. Uh, dysprosium because he was he was looking into um, the the spectral band and he it indicated a new element was there and this he was able to to find that it was separate from the metal that it was together with and he actually successfully isolated um, a sample and then he named it dysprosium, which in Greek means difficult to obtain. Uh, it's also was later uh, changed to the Greek word dys dysprositos, which means hard to get, which is very much true to dysprosium because dysprosium is a very hard to get uh, rare earth metal and actually until the 1950s it wasn't isolated in a pure form uh, because it's such a difficult metal to separate from the metals that it comes together with and um, something about dysprosium that's really unique is that dysprosium is very reactive in air and water and so it's it's a it's a metal that works really well together with with other elements as an alloy. So alone, alone it's an element, but together with other metals, it's considered an alloy. And that's how we actually started using dysprosium was it together with other elements, other metals to put it into use. And so really we started using this dysprosium rare earth metal in the 1950s when it was we were able to separate it into its pure form. And that was used mainly as nuclear con control rods to absorb the neutrons. So going back to that really, really high melting point of dysprosium, dysprosium has this mega high melting point. I think it was like 1500 degrees uh, Celsius or like 1800 uh, degrees Fahrenheit. Let's go back and just check here. Okay, even more. So 1400 degrees Celsius and 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit, really, really hot. Uh, because it is such a, a high melting point, it means that it actually is able to resist demagnetization. So it's a, it's a permanent magnet because it's it resists demagnetization at a very, very high melting point. And it's really, that makes it perfect for motors, electric vehicles, generator, generators, wind turbines, anything that uses uh uses these elements at a very high temperature with dysprosium it's a very it's a very uh resilient element because it doesn't melt at, at these high temperatures it can withstand really really high temperatures and that's why it was mainly used as nuclear control rods to absorb these neutrons and and act as this and act as this uh, this shield against radiation in uh, in nuclear uh, centers to, to harness nuclear energy. Now, because there's been this increase of demand for electric vehicles, as you know, Tesla uh, is really big, uh, and a lot of a lot of companies are following suit. Ford and BMW, a lot of companies are 
finding that electric vehicles is the future of, of vehicles. I know many people have differing opinions about electric vehicles, but there's a huge, right now, there is a huge demand for these electric vehicles. And dysprosium is one of the main um, elements that's used in the motors to create these vehicles. They're used in the motors, in the engine, in the engine and in the internal combustion units. Because it is an element that can be really used uh, in high temperature situations, it's perfect for anything to do with motors, electric vehicles, generators, uh, and even wind turbines. And that goes into what is its use in the real world. These are some of the, the use cases for dysprosium, the, what, how, it's, how it is integrated into products that are, we are building and creating and innovating every day. So wind power, power plants, wind turbines, electronic devices, uh, generators, like I said, electric motors, internal combustion units, and electric vehicles, shielding material and nuclear reactors. So I was saying the it's it's bound with other metals to create these alloys that can shield against against radiation, and so we can create nuclear power, nuclear energy. Um, it's also used uh, some uh, obscure things like laser materials and uh, and commercial lighting. So it's it's used in a wide variety of things that we are doing a lot of development into. And as you can see, here are some of the pictures of the main things that dysprosium is used for in our everyday life. And it's something that, you know, energy is, we always just assume it's going to be there, right? But there's actually huge infrastructure and companies and business and, and our, our governments that are putting more thought into how are we creating energy, sustainable, sustainable energy for the future. And dysprosium is a key element into this uh, future development of green energy products. And so that's something they're going to be talking about a little bit more in the next video in part two for dysprosium. But this is kind of just an over, overview of what the metal is and what it's all about and um and so that you get can even get a picture of what dysprosium is used for mainly the number one use case for this metal is for electric vehicles right now um and so as you can see there is a lot of there's a lot of ways that dysprosium is used diversely but the main thing is this picture right here on the right electric vehicles is really taking a lot of dysprosium and actually this dysprosium is only created at about 100 tons per year and that's not very much it is a limited rare earth metal it is rare and there's really not a lot of substitutes for dysprosium right now so it's something that has a, a huge potential for the future and that is what we're going to talk about in the next video so i hope that this was educational and you learned a few things about dysprosium that maybe you did not know before and i look forward to talking a little bit more about dysprosium specifically the price uh the price trends over the last three years of how dysprosium has in the past performed but also i uh, look forward to sharing with you what is the expected demand for the future for this really awesome rare earth metal. So until next time for part two, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your week and I'll see you for our next Tech Metals Tuesday. Bye.